Welcome to NGF News, everybody. Uh, we've had a long, long break from our uh, podcast in the recent weeks, and I hope you guys have heard our little mini uh, trailer episode that we're going to discuss about the new seasons, and this is the start of it. So we're going to have a latest global developments episode today. We are going to be discussing Blinken's latest visit to China and the new U.S.-India partnership. Awesome. Great. So let's get started straight into Blinken's visit into China. Um, this is a pretty massive uh, deal for the international stage, especially considering that Blinken once canceled it back in February, was it? Yes. Uh, it was February for the spy balloon. So here we are. Um, and before we really get into depth, the overall outcome was that it was fruitful discussion. Very fruitful um, discussion, yes. Blinken was able to talk successfully with President Xi Jinping and his team. Um, they were good discussions, substantive, uh, constructive, and they were focused on bilateral um, priorities for global, regional, and also, um, yeah, I already said bilateral. Anyways, yeah. I was going to repeat that again. But <laughs> their goal is to focus on more communication and reduce mis uh, mismanagement. And also, they're also committed uh, to continue to stay competitive, if that makes sense. So. Yeah. They they went in there and they were like, listen, we understand that we we've been uh we've been not so well with each other. We've been miscommunicating here and there. So how about this? Let's start fresh and let's say that we do have some problems that we need to address. So that yes. was kind of like the the main gist of it. And then there's also some little little talking points, some very very important talking points. Now this is a very important visit because it's the first time that a U.S. high official has been to China since 2018. So this is. It's not only like I would say I would say revolutionary, but it's like critical because the fact that they haven't had a visit to either of each other's countries um, is is probably one of the reasons for the mistake and the lack of communications because there's just no relationship. So this is a good, strong move by uh, the Biden administration and Blinken's administration and the um, Department of State, where. They can try to create that lateral and bi or bilateral um, communications. So they had three big discussion topics. First one was Taiwan. The second one was Ukraine and Russia. And the next one was military to military communications. Starting with Taiwan. So this is one of the biggest issues with the between the two. The United States wants it to be a self democratically ran society, Taiwan, but they're also they have a one. China mindset as well as they have previously stated in State Department of many administrations. So, but the Chinese obviously it said right here that the China are not has no room to compromise or concede on the issue of Taiwan. So this is going to be that's definitely an interesting part. It says the U.S. must respect China's sovereignty and territorial integrity and clearly oppose Taiwan. And this comes straight from ABC, I believe. So I mean. That was kind of a given mm -hmm. in one of their, in in this, what was it, what you call it, main talking points? Yeah, the talking points, yes. They were they were both, the United States and China, they were firm on their positions regarding Taiwan, and I think there won't ever be wiggle room to yeah. try to come up with a solution here. Um, It will take many, many years to solve the Taiwan issue. I mean, how long has it been an issue for? Oh, um, years. I mean, and 2013 is when... Xi Jinping really like focused on it when he came into yeah. office. So it's been a long time. My my biggest concern with with Blinken is him and their administration is not taking a harder stance. Not saying to go in and say like, oh, we're opposed you reunifying with Taiwan. I would say maybe come in and like let's try to create a deal, like a partnership. Let's create a China Taiwan partnership with the US. So we can kind of Create a relationship, start a dialogue, which can eventually turn into either Taiwan wanting to reunify democratically or China saying, all right, let's just give up. That might likely not happen, but it could at least start a dialogue there. So like I a, hope his stance a firm changes. stance on a trilateral talk. Just maybe just, uh, just a firm stance. I mean, they don't just, even see Taiwan as part of the yeah. trilateral thing. They're like, well, we don't. It's it. They're, they're Taiwan oh. is. Taiwan is China, so it's like, how can it be a bilateral? I guess then you can call it a a bilateral talk with an observer. I don't know, like something twist, like twist that. the words. Yeah, 
I, I kind of like that idea, and I wish that came out to be. But again, this is just there was no major breakthrough out of this talk, but it just really opened up to more diplomatic engagement. So we could possibly see this um, in the future as well. Um, sure. The next thing, uh, what was the next thing? Ukraine, Ukraine and Russia. Yes. Okay. China is officially neutral. They 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 basically told the U.S. that there is no contention with Washington. That they are neutral. Um, it, it, this is the the shortest paragraph of the article. It said, "It voiced concern late last year of Beijing could provide uh this to provide lethal military aid, but." That has yet to be proven that they have done that, and and China has basically just said like we have we want no involvement. We're just you know trying to create a solution, so that's good. And um, do we want to believe it though? That's my main question. I mean, Is are they publicly neutral now? And hypothetically, something happens in Russia, Ukraine, and the Chinese just have to step in. I believe it because I just don't think they're stupid enough to get themselves involved in a war. Yeah. That they're not necessarily supposed to be involved in. Um, especially they don't the have to be West. involved. They can be involved the way in which NATO is yeah, but that's somewhat involved. In the eyes of NATO, that of course, like just like with Russia, like, you know, we're not uh, ground troops in Ukraine, but we're sending them weapons, so we're involved. Same thing is if China sends Russia weapons, they're technically involved in our eyes. And I would say, I would agree. I would say they're involved because I agree we're involved. We're, yeah. You say we're not involved because but we're sending we weapons. We're involved. Oh, we are. Like, that's stupid. Um, but I mean, it, it's good that they, they told them this. I mean, as long as, long as they're honest about it, yep. that's good. So, but that, that was a quick, easy breezy one. The next one though is the military to military communications. This is basically where everything goes wrong with us because I mean, we do, how many missions over the South China Sea, Air Force, Navy, and they do the same thing. They also are building up those islands that are in the South China Sea because they're basically said that they're not afraid to take Taiwan by force. Correct. And so that's where the U.S. is getting a little you know, edgy with the Chinese. And so this issue was highlighted earlier in the year, um, as we quote from the article, because of the spy balloon incident where the U.S. officials tried to um, – all the phone lines that were dedicated to like crisis phone lines to the Chinese military, and they just didn't pick up. So they were a little upset about that. And so they said that the U.S. has been trying hard to reestablish these emergency lines, but the Chinese have not agreed to move forward with it as of yet. Now, this wasn't only like a couple day talk, and uh, I forget who the foreign minister is, Quinn Gang. He said that he is will. Um, going to make a trip to Washington sometime. There wasn't a date. But he's willing to make a trip to Washington to continue these talks. So maybe it'll be discussed in the future. But those are some of the key... Those are the main three key points that were brought up in the meeting to establish relationship. Yep. But the good thing is, is the Chinese readout said that the meeting was candid, in-depth, and constructive. That's... Cool. Neutral terms are better than good terms because that actually means that they got somewhere. Yeah. It was like, oh, this meeting was great. Uh, they're lying. Yeah. You know, and if the meeting is bad, it means it was bad. Yeah. But these are good neutral terms, which means that they're going forward and that relationship is going to be reestablished, hopefully. Yep. I think the big thing is waiting to see when this DC meeting happens. Mm -hmm. And I think the first thing that will be discussed, as you said, was the military communications, because I read, um, as I was reading through, it said that the Chinese had declined the U S proposal to resume military to military communication because of U S sanctions on China. Uh, so I don't know sense, which but... sanctions exactly they were referencing. It just says that the Chinese were not yet ready because of U S sanctions on China. And how they view um, Taiwan as well, and how they do their drills in the South China Sea as well. So it's kind of a mix of two yeah. things. Listen, the, the, here's the thing. The more the United States and China become intertwined together, the less likely that China is going to invade Taiwan. So here's the proposal that Blinken should come with. He should come into China. Uh, of course, this has to go through the Biden administration and everyone else, but he should go to China with approval from the administration and say, look, we're going to remove our sanctions. You remove yours. And then let's create a trade deal. 
let's create, let's say, you know, an economic free zone between the U.S. and China on our waters and your waters. So anything that's Chinese goes through the, the U.S. and anything that's in the United States goes through to China free. You know what they're missing here? Is they're intertwining geopolitics and military with economics. Mm-hmm. And the results of what happens geopolitically also affects it economically. Do we agree that the Chinese are playing a dangerous game in Taiwan? Yes, of course. But we should not forget that the U.S. and China run the global economy. And anything that happens to either one of us is, we're going to feel it heavy. So I think what we should do, or what they should do in the next DC meeting is say, look, I understand that you, we have different views on China, on uh, Taiwan, but let's also realize the importance of economics. Like you said, like, you remove your sanctions, or remove our, my sanctions, free free trade, or whatever trade deal they cut, and leave the geopolitics aside. Call it a day, because you don't need, you, the more you make progress is the, the next time you have a meeting, you make more progress. Because yeah, a, free, a free trade deal is essentially easy, because all it's saying is that when you move products for my country, tariff free. Tariff free. I move products to your country, tariff free. Tariff free. Simple, easy peasy. Now, all you got to do is put pen to paper, sign it. And if anyone breaks it, you know, whatever. You talk about it and you figure it out. It'll likely not happen. So it, it'll definitely be much, it'll be like a good stepping stone to the, the next meeting, to the next meeting, to the next meeting. And so, and I, I read an article the other day too, the reason why this is so important, where the, it says that. The EU, as in general, and the UK are lagging behind the United States so much in terms of economics that in a few years, the gap is going to be basically not unclosable. Like, Europe will not be able to even come close to the United States in terms of economic standards. So this deal could be so important to the United States, but also to the EU, where the EU could say, well, okay, we we it, to that. let's do it too. Free trade. You know, whatever goes into the Eurozone, free. Whatever we go into the Beijing, free. Easy. I wish it was that easy, though. I wish it was it's, that easy, It's yeah. the geopolitics, and it's the... It's it's just the politics that... You know, it, it's unfortunate because, like, we, we talk about human rights, and we talk about climate change, and we talk about um, war. And then we want to solve these issues, and we want to fix the problems, but then when... Solutions come to the table like economic ones. Everyone's like, oh, well, they're violating human rights. Well, you know, if you economically intertwine yourself with them, human rights might not be violated anymore because they're going to realize that if we keep violating human rights, we're going to lose billions of dollars. Correct. And, and not, it's not going to happen overnight. It, you mean to tell China right now to stop you know, putting the Uyghurs in camps? You know, it's not going to change tomorrow. But there are solutions that can change over time. That we have to really focus on. Right. And economics is the a snowball effect. Yeah. You start somewhere. You start with one meeting, like you said. Go to a different one. Go to a third one. Then you can start solving economic problems. Then they don't want to risk it. That that's that's smart. It's just a snowball effect. Yeah. Um. Another thing that came out of these talks that I wanted to talk about was strengthening people to people exchanges, including direct flights, including increasing the number of direct flights between the United States and China. Oh. So that was another another big thing that came out of this. Primarily, they were targeting student-to-student exchanges. Beijing, both Beijing and uh, Washington, they both want students to travel abroad in different countries. And I think this is a great idea because now you have students culturally mixing with mm-hmm. one another and learning about each other. And now you have an educated youth who will now be the next leaders, right, of the Chinese students will now be the next leaders of, you know, China and yeah, vice, versa. vice versa, yeah. And I think this would be a fantastic way to bolster and kind of ensure the re- the U.S. China relationship. Yeah. Um, and I think this is a fantastic idea. But my really reluctance is China has a mass surveillance problem. Like yes, they spy everybody. on everybody. How comfortable would U.S. students be to go to China and to study there in places like Beijing, Shanghai, when they have this mass surveillance problem? I personally wouldn't feel comfortable to go abroad and study in china i would love to i would love to have that experience and to talk to chinese students and be a part of that culture right but i don't think i'd be comfortable knowing that i'm being watched every day and and they're definitely you know 
things that we can do because uh, again, it, it, if they do surveil U.S. citizens, that is, you know, a, a breach of our sovereignty personally and the U.S. sovereignty. So, I mean, we can come up with an agreement that says, like, you know, like we we're gonna acknowledge that you watch your people, not tell you not to watch your people, but don't surveil ours. Make a little your agreement, you know, something you you can sign doesn't have to be public record, whatever. Something like that, that can it kind of ensure the student to feel better. Because, I mean, we, we let's get real here. The United States, with a Chinese citizen is coming to China, we're surveilling that person, too. That's just how it is. Yep. Well, it, it, it's part of our national security. At least of a threat. I mean, we don't really survey them. We don't we, follow them. We don't. But follow, we, know we're still the, we know where they are. We know what they're doing. We don't follow every move, like when they're like eating out or what they're doing late at night. But like, we have an idea for when, like, if something weird happens, you know, we can tap into that wire and figure out what, who that person is or if it is that person in general. Right. That's something that the Chinese can do. I mean, it's a national security issue. I'm not going to tell you that all the students we send over there are going to be great students. We don't know. We can only do so much. Oh, so much vetting. Just the same as, you know, they send over our, their students. Right. It's the same thing. So you're not going to tell them not to worry about them. It's a foreign entity in your country. But obviously they shouldn't be, you know, they shouldn't turn around and like see a Chinese official pop out of the background and walk across. <laughs> And feel like they're being followed. Right. Um, and then that's obviously, you know, a joke. You know what I mean? Yeah. By that route. I mean, this is also fantastic for business to business exchanges as well. Of you course. The number of direct flights and having to want more people to people exchanges. That only means like more, more economic opportunities for startups in China, startups in the U.S. who want to tap into the two biggest markets in the world. More business collaboration, too, because the more that they get into intertwined again, it, it forces governments to kind of like, OK, we like if something's going wrong, we need to establish a dialogue because right. we're, we're screwing over our businesses. Yep. So. so I think I think this is a step in the right direction and a much needed one. I think we praise this for like we, we've been calling this out this need to have a talk with China for like since of one of our earliest episodes. Yeah, a long time. And 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 when Blinkton had to cancel because of the spy balloon. At that point, I thought in my head, it's just it's over. it's not gonna happen. Yeah. Like it, the communication is gonna be broke is gonna be broken. Um so this is a good thing. It's what seen the wake of a war that's going on right now. Because I think what it shows is China's commitment to the international order and then it shows the u.s's commitment to just you know not breach sovereignty in, in many ways yeah hopefully uh hopefully the next meeting happens and good this yeah. is this is this was much needed and i'm i'm proud of what the united states has done yeah definitely. so moving on now ah. this is this is the most shocking one not shocking but really fascinating really lovely in my opinion too so we're going to talk about the new U.S. India partnership. Um, so this is a brand new collaboration working group partnership, whatever you want to call it. They were pretty vague in what they called it um, on strategic technologies and security. So the goal of the United States and India is one is that India wants to join the United States in air and maritime exercises. Uh, they want to work on things such as cyberspace, critical technology like uh, semiconductors, uh, AI, advanced sensors, quantum physics, um, and undersea, um, what was it? Something undersea. Forgot, but something under the water. The water, okay. The water. Um, but it's, um, India wants this because, well, both of us want it because we see this as an important strategic partnership for combating not only regional regional enemies but also bringing international order as well yeah for sure so multiple administrations in the past have seen them and it's like the, the counterbalance the economic alternative and democratic contrast to china but immediately after the wake of a big visit to the, the chinese uh and to beijing now modi is coming to the united states under a lot of scrutiny, of course, with the human rights violations that are currently going on within India. Um, but we're, we're going to brush over that for, for two reasons. One, we don't know if it's true, so we're not going to talk about it. Like, not, not that we don't know if it's true. We don't know if it's, like, 
legible legible something i can't think of the word yeah right now they're, they're human they're human rights allegations and so we're not going to discuss them because we don't know if they're true or not the second part that is modi said the other um the other day because they're about to ha- they're about to have their dinner right now um at the white house that the partnership will be instrumental in enhancing the strength of the world now this is a great great quote by modi because it shows India's commitment to the world. They used to be kind of like isolated and like themselves trying to figure out what they were going to do. But now they realize that they have to branch out. Trade reached a total of $191 billion. That is a record between the two. Um, Washington and New Delhi have now discussed what the Russians Ukraine war. Um, Modi saying that we may not see eye to eye on the Russian situation, but we're willing to discuss it. And you know, come up to the solution. Big. Very big. Like, India understands the importance of putting, what we said before in China, putting geopolitics aside and focus on regional, I mean, really international security and economic yeah. cooperation. So, uh, they named this initiative. What was it? I think I got it. It's called Indus X. Indus X. Let's go on. In this X, it's um, an initiative to accelerate, accelerate, accelerate commercial tech with military application. It's great. It's a pretty badass name. I can't it lie. is a badass name. <laughs> I can't lie. And, and, and this partnership is going to be extremely important because India is the fifth largest economy with about $3 trillion in GDP, a little bit more, if I'm not mistaken. And, and, and my estimate is that in five to 10 years, they're going to be the third largest economy in the world if they do the right things, you know, make the right trade deals, bring people out of poverty, keep building up and everything. Um, their cities, that'll be important. Um, and so recently before this week as well, before they met, Elon Musk and other CEOs and uh, other health leading officials also were in India. Yeah, discussing yeah. business ideas like AI, bringing Tesla and you know uh, electric cars to India, and, and Elon Musk even went as far as saying, "I quote: Hopefully, in the next few years, there will be a Tesla factory in New Delhi." That's you know, I'm not going to quote that actually. That's paraphrase, but that's cool. You it's know, that's great. Major step in the right direction, yeah. and a huge win for the Indian government. Um, I want to talk about now moving on to more. Let's talk more about the defense stuff. This is what really caught my eye is that the goal of Indus X, which is the military application um, initiative, they want to achieve five billion worth in defense exports by 2025. Five billion? Five billion dollars. So what they want to do is that they want to, the United States and India both want to um, exchange um what was it exchange people to people so human capital yeah um to do defense weapons research for both um india and the united states which is i mean that's great because the the one thing that india has always been reluctant to do was get itself involved militarily the military in indo Pacific, which is is what surprised me yeah because this is like a really big like shifting stance yeah and and, and of course it's their their right to not get involved but now like you said this this um the stance is shifting and so you know maybe we can see in the future a uh, military partnership with with japan and south korea and australia um new zealand which could kind of change the indo-pacific and also um kind of Push China away. The fear is that China is going to go to Taiwan, and then the United States is going to step in, and the war is going to start there. Japan, South Korea are afraid they're going to like get their sovereignty stepped on with the Chinese. But India has always just been like, you know, there's nothing out there for us. China's not going to invade us in our homeland. What should we worry about? But then a war is going to spill over eventually. If if it does happen, because they're gonna have to, we're gonna have to invade China. Right. Which is how it is ended, unfortunately. So this this shows their defense shift, and, and also it's a world defense shift. Everybody is upping their budgets and um, creating new partnerships with the United States. So this is this is pretty important, and it shows that the world 
is scared of you know war. They're very scared. Which, They're very scared, and the way for peace is deterrence. Is what I'm taking away from from this. Unfortunately, yes. Is that is. the only way to peace is through deterrence and? It's always been like that. Like, like the only reason I say unfortunately is because like we have to resort to building up our military. But like, I, 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 I agree. We have to do it. It's always been like that. Yep. World War started because another army didn't have another country didn't have an army and one did. It's gonna take a while before we take well that that part of men, our mentality disappears, and I don't think that'll ever happen because it's been ingrained in us for thousands of our thousands of years of world history and there's always bad people out there yeah there always is there's always going to be that's an unfortunate part of the human nature is there's always going to be someone out there that wants to take over the world you know hitler was one Genghis khan mussolini vladimir putin stalin he, he, i'm not going to call xi jinping a dictator but i mean like yeah. he, he wants economic dictatorship over the world so yeah, there's always going to be a bad player Military deterrence is the way to stop that bad player. Yep. Moving on. What else do they have here? Ooh, Micron. Want to invest $800 million in India also as well. How much? For $800 million. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They want to do semiconductor research in India. They want to take um, the skilled labor in India and build, build chips. This is where the U.S. is kind of being very strategic. So what we did was create, obviously, the Chips and Sciences Act, where we put $180 billion into our own chip making. Now, what's the next goal? Try to outsource it to cheap labor. India. And then India can produce, if, if they get it right, can produce far more than what Taiwan can. So then in the end, investment. maybe LinkedIn was saying... I keep saying Blinken. I think Blinken. Blinken. Yeah, yeah. Blinken. Uh, Blinken was saying to China that we have a one China policy and that we're going to stick with it and not even talk about Taiwan because we don't need them anymore because we're going to get India. We're going to have us. And then if, if the EU decides to join in on their chip side, you know, there you go. What do we need? Well, <laughs> you got me yeah yeah you got me and then other than that that's about it um so again semiconductor research ai tech and military was the big talking points yeah public um, partnerships is another one here that i see oh yeah yeah uh h1b and l skilled visas as well they want to increase mm-hmm. the number of them good good that should be that should just be a U.S. thing in general. They should increase them in total. Unfortunately, they're uh, also the immigration process sucks. Yeah, so this is a step good. in the right direction. In we general, need, we need to we need to up our H one B and L skill visas. Yeah, in general, but, also um, bring back our factories. Onshore wind, green hydrogen, all the goodies, all the green tech. They want they want to create it all in this U.S. India partnership. Yeah, there's also the, the other the one that we're talking about with China is the academic initiatives where we're going to try and bring in more uh, students. We there's about two hundred thousand students that come from India to the United States to go to school. Yep. And Modi said that he is. Welcome to all Americans coming to, uh, specifically, he said New Delhi. Uh, so I don't know of any other city, like Mumbai is another one they can I assume all of India, but New Delhi is probably the place to go in. Yeah. yeah. I thought that's, that's good. I mean, another, another case where we can have the youth kind of understand each other's cultures and then they can come together and make a good partnership and in the future, right after university, straight into business. Yeah. Like, think about it. Like, when, I, when we just did our study abroad, to Europe, um, France, Belgium, Netherlands, and Switzerland. What did we, we understood how they lived. If you understand how they live, you may not agree with it, but you understand how they think and you can kind of come to compromises and understandings because you know how they feel culturally, politically, and whatnot. So it could be, it could be beneficial to the future. Yeah. Um, And other than that, yep. And then Biden, of course, needs to work on Democratic backsliding in India, human rights issues, religious discrimination, treatment of minorities, and press freedoms. But this is something that Biden said, look, we understand there's a problem, but we're going to help you fix this little by little while not trying to encroach on your sovereignty. But most importantly, and um, economics, innovation, defense. New partnerships as well for economics. Um, they And it goes back to the thing where you said, like, if they focus on all three, they can't risk 
the rest of these issues like human rights and democratic backsliding. Hurting they them. they yeah. can't risk this. They cannot like they can't afford to f this all up because of interactions. Yeah. And uh, the Biden well, human rights activist groups have basically said that the Biden administration should call out India and Modi publicly, but the Biden administration basically said we're going to work it out in private because you know that's just it came to us. That's not we're not going to just like decline them. soil them on our soil. Yeah, I because mean, I hope it happens works. because whenever anything happens in private. You don't really know. Yeah, you don't really know. And so I hope it's not. I want to go back to the Micron thing real quick. And I just hope it's not a thing where it's like we're going to outsource all our labor in India and take advantage of. Yes, I hope that's not the case. I hope that's not the case with what's going on and what Modi is thinking of. It's like, okay, I can bring in more money, but I would also have to give up some human capital. To this. to attract U.S. investors, which I hope is not the case. I hope they get they'll get paid and treated well. Mm-hmm. But that's we'll the goal. See. That is the goal. That is the goal. But this this is great. I mean, if you go to uh, media defense or media dot defense dot gov, you can see the entire fact sheet on Indus X. Um, it's it's very fascinating. It's a good read, and obviously, it's important to. You know, this is a big, major player, India. India is going to be the third largest economy in the next 15 years. Oh, Min- with this? That's yeah. max. They, they, I'd say Min- they could probably be in the next five if they really, really focus on yep. strategy. So, What a good week for U.S. foreign policy. For U.S. foreign policy in the world. I mean, yeah. this, this shows collaboration is, you know, finally kind of seeking its way back to what it wasn't. Unfortunately, in in the Trump administrations in in the early, you know, in the late twenty teens. Yep. So, yeah, maybe globalization is not yet. Dead. Yeah. Dead just yet. So. Not yet. There's been a big fear that the world won't converge, but it's all inevitable. roads say otherwise. It's inevitable. <laughs> it's always has been. Yep. So, awesome. Yeah. You got anything else? No. I'm all good here. I'm all good. Awesome. So thank you all for uh, tuning in to this week's latest global developments. Hope you guys enjoyed that one. And we will see you in the next episode. See ya.